Got it. Hey, aloha, and welcome back to the Think Tech Hawaii studios for this episode of Security Matters Hawaii. Today, we have author Mel Fatobab with us, and we're going to be talking about the friendship advantage. Uh, Mel, thank you so much for joining me today. I know you're a super busy guy, so I appreciate you sharing with us. My pleasure, Andrew. A pleasure to be with you. Thank you. I've got to, I've got to do my, my own um, sort of uh, generosity thing for a minute because I've, I'm one of these guys, I happen to know about 20 or 30 maybe more um, security CEOs and owners who've shared with me many wonderful things. And I think that I can blame you for that, <laughs> that you influence <laughs> them in, in a lot of the meetings and then they, they bring that same generosity out into the rest of the community. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's right. So, so um, I'd like, uh, if you could go ahead and give our audience um, just a little bit of your background, as much as you care to share, sort of bring us up through EO and then into uh, the, you know, the, um, Forum Resources Network, and uh, maybe up to this book. You got it. You got it. So uh, 1990, fresh out of college, got a job uh, as associate director of the entrepreneurs organization. Uh, within about a year, I was promoted to executive director. And while I was there, we were putting together forums for our members, our entrepreneur members. And uh, these forums were groups of roughly eight to 10 people that uh, meet every month to help each other with anything and everything so they could be the best that they can be. And by 97, it became my favorite part of my job. I really uh, decided this is what my life's work is gonna be. So I quit, I started Forum Resources Network, and that's how I got into the business of peer groups for CEOs, entrepreneurs, and uh, how I started with the PSA Security Network and. Uh, and with these groups that we've got going with them, uh, it's been absolutely wonderful. We've had two groups for 10 years now, wow. uh, maybe even 11 for one of those years. And uh, it's been really amazing to watch the relationships within the groups blossom and, uh, and to see some members, you know, sell their businesses or, or do amazing things. Yeah, it's interesting. And I, um, so the security, folks, security people tend, in my mind, to be sort of, I'm going to say hard-headed, and that's probably not very nice, but they come from like law enforcement backgrounds or military backgrounds a lot of the times, and relationship building maybe isn't their first skill. Um, how, did you, how did you hone in, or how did you break into working with security groups in particular? Yeah, uh, there was a guy, Mark Murphy, who uh, was a speaker for PSA, and uh, he heard that PSA was interested in uh, putting together a couple of groups, and he referred them uh, to me, and uh, that's, that's how I uh, got started with PSA Security. Well, and then are there other security groups outside of that, or other like low-voltage industry groups that you work with that you, know, you could compare and contrast, like security ownership with... Um, like other, because we're sort of like contracting industry folks. Um, are there other groups that you work with that are contractors, like, you know, electrical contractors or construction, you know, uh, I guess like, you know, general contractors that build buildings and things like that? Do they have groups like this as well? They do. They do. So there's definitely, uh, there are groups in the construction industry through the National Association of Home Builders. Uh, they call them 20 groups, and I've worked with some of those groups over the years. Uh, there are um, some construction companies that I work with directly, one out of New Jersey, one out of Chicago. And uh, really, at the end of the day, I, I'm going to go back to what you said. You know, you're like, how did you get these people that are bullheaded <laughs> to, uh, to really kind of uh, soften up and listen to one another? And, you know, what I would say is the process is pretty uh, proven. It's the same process that... I've, I've applied to many entrepreneur groups over the years. And um, I would say just being an entrepreneur or a CEO also requires a bit of bullheadedness. I wouldn't necessarily ah. say that uh, that is more true in my observation 
of the security folks, I'd simply say uh, they're entrepreneurs, they're CEOs. And, and uh, what I hear from a lot of CEOs, Andrew, I don't know if you've heard this, is, you know, I'm not employable. <laughs> <laughs> I started my business because I'm not employable. Yeah. Well, my uh, wife it, says it, that about me, but I don't, I don't know if I said it about myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so back to, to the other question is, you know, how do we get to the book? So what I started realizing in working with a lot of these groups is often people would say, wow, you guys are like better than my best friends. Or I've shared things with you that I haven't shared with my best friends. And initially, I, I took pride in that. I'm like, we're doing something really good here. Uh, but I started to realize the reason for the book is, is so people can take these lessons and apply them in other parts of life, apply them to their relationships at work, apply them to their relationships outside of work. And these groups were simply a conduit to teach those skills. Um, so the seven keys to building relationships really comes from what I learned in working with these groups since 1991. Wow. Yeah, and I know um, in particular this book opens, it opens with a story about Carl, who's a fictitious person for our purposes, but um, I think all of us can empathize with what Carl was going through with a medical condition, with a family member of his. Um, what do you think differentiates the company that allows everyone else to empathize and share in Carl and, and the ones who don't? I think the culture starts at the top. So whenever I go work with a company, I can tell you 99% of the time, I'm getting a call from the CEO. Okay. Nobody else. Nobody else is making that purchase decision for whatever reason. It's coming from the CEO, whether I've worked with a company that's a $2 million company or a multi hundred million dollar company. It's always a call from the CEO. Wow. And the culture starts at the top. So I start with the executive team and how does the executive team work together? What are their tools for communication? How effective are they? How do they deal with conflict? Do they avoid it? Do they take it head on and, you know, kind of punch each other or do they do it kindly? Uh, so the chapter on that, conversation is called kind truth and kind truth is is the ability the skill to say the difficult thing that has to be said in a way that is pleasant in a way that it's going to be heard and not just to bludgeon somebody on the head with it or to avoid the conversation altogether because you know what happens when you avoid it yeah. it doesn't go away <laughs> of course um so interestingly i had i've i've seen it you know myself just from a small business perspective but I didn't consider the fact that larger organizations may require this relationship building to happen amongst the, like the C-suite if it's large or upper management first before it can really flow down, I guess genuinely flow down um, to middle management and to others, uh, other team members on the staff. Would that be a, a fair thing to say? That's, that's how it's been in my world. I mean, I could imagine that there's a big multi-billion dollar public company where they say we have a problem in XYZ department, but it always starts with the head of that department. Because if the head of that department doesn't buy in to the notion that we're going to have open com communication, that we're gonna treat each other as human beings and not just transactionally, and that means we're gonna be vulnerable, we're gonna be real. If the head of that department, if the CEO isn't buying into that and isn't setting that example, then Who's going to buy it? Mm. Yeah, it's interesting. When, um, when did you start to see in business in general um, the, 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 the change to relationships? I mean, was it already there in the 90s where everyone was already recognizing this, this, this need to, to relate to other? I mean, I remember like IBM sales training, for example, where you know you, you made your statement and then you didn't say anything else until the other guy spoke and all that type of stuff. So. Was there a recognition early on, or was this fairly new to, to the business community itself, to the relationship building could actually improve the bottom line, improve productivity, efficiency, all those sort of things? I think we're riding a trend. Uh, I mean, I, I'll never forget. I worked at uh, General Motors as a co-op when I was in college, okay. and this was in the late 80s. And uh, the CFO who was CFO of this plant was this guy that uh, was kind of a mentor to me. and I. Thought he was the sweetest, nicest guy that 
I could imagine. And I was singing his praises to some of my coworkers, and I couldn't believe what they said. Oh. They said you should have been here two years ago. Oh, he wow. He literally stands on somebody's desk. He would stand on somebody's desk and yell at them <laughs> at the top of his lungs. And wow. that is not the same person I knew. Uh, so I think we're part of a trend, and I think more and more companies are becoming aware of this uh, of this trend and the importance of treating people like human beings. Um, I'm speaking April 23rd uh, at a conference, uh, Conscious Capitalism, ah. and there are 500 people coming to this event, and really they're all about how can we be conscious about what we're doing as a company, mm -hmm. how we're treating our people, and not just running this machine that's here to make money. Yeah, I don't know if that was left over from sort of a assembly line type of mentality from industrial revolution, the whole, you know, you're a piece of a, of a, of a system that moves stuff through instead of you're actually the investment, you're actually the value of the firm itself. And I, I, I'm, I, don't, I don't, I'm not schooled enough in this to know when that sort of occurred, but obviously it's needed. I mean, I, I don't, I don't know. I don't know how organizations function today, keep staff, build any kind of morale or anything at all without sort of that, a bit of others, other centeredness, you know, at least understanding what other, others are going through, you know, what your coworkers are going through. Uh, it, it's interesting to me that, that things happened at all. It must have been very sterile. You know, I mean, the Navy was, I guess, kind of sterile when I got in in the early 80s, but it, it, it changed a bit, you know, with tail hook and, this, this focus on, um, on, on HR and sexual harassment, things like that. It was a, a bit of a wake-up call in the military. Um, and I'm, I'm just guessing that commercial industry sort of followed some of that, that uh, awareness about other and the condition of other and how we impact other with our words and our actions. Yeah, and it's funny that you use the military reference because one of the things that I know from my friends who have served in the military is particularly if you've been in a war zone with somebody, you develop this real powerful bonds. And part of what I uh, believe causes that bond is, you know, when you're in a foxhole with somebody, when you have a shared purpose, when you have those shared values of what are we gonna do to, to survive, taking it to an extreme case in the company, it's not usually about survival, yeah. but in the military, it certainly is. Yes. That bonds people in a way that you cannot imagine. And yeah. well, you can imagine it because you've been there. Yeah, so I think I think recreating that it's I do I do talk about that with our team. If you haven't had sort of that that sense of life saving urgency, right? Everybody does their job or someone dies. That that kind of an idea doesn't doesn't it's hard to sell that in a in a corporate environment because no one should be dying, obviously. As long as, you know, we're taking safety and, and things responsible. Um, it's interesting Absolutely. it's yeah. interesting that's to that's get, Go ahead. Yeah. So the other thing is, whether you're talking about security uh, companies or whether you're talking about any company in general, and you look at the low unemployment rate in this country right now, you know finding good talent is not easy. Retaining good talent is not easy. And it's costly. And so if we have the people on the bus that we want on the bus, then let's invest in getting them to actually love each other, mm. know each other as human beings and value their time at work more than just coming in and getting a paycheck. Yeah, and I, I do think there's that, that sense of personal sharing, being able to empathize with what others go through in their life, you know, outside of the work, I, I, you know, creating that shared experience. And we're, gonna, we're definitely going to kind of walk through these seven keys and walk through the book in the second half of our episode. But I do think that that's a, it's a critical element that, I, I, you know, a, a lot of the great offices that I go in have that going on. but I, I'm. I'm sure there's many that are still missing the boat trying to catch up, and maybe those of us who are doing this will hire all their good people away from that. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Tell you what, we're going to take a break for about one minute. We'll pay a few bills, and we'll be right back, Mo. All right. Thank you. Hi, I'm Rusty Komori, host of Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. My show is based on my book, also titled Beyond the Lines, and it's about creating a superior culture of excellence leadership, and finding greatness. I interview guests who are successful in business, sports, and life, which is sure to inspire you in finding your greatness. Join me every Monday as we go beyond the lines at 11 a.m. Aloha. 
Aloha and mabuhay. My name is Emmy Ortega Anderson, inviting you to join us every Tuesday here on Pinoy Power Hawaii with Think Tech Hawaii. We come to your home at 12 noon every Tuesday. We invite you to uh, listen, watch uh, for our mission of empowerment. We aim to enrich, enlighten, educate, entertain, and we hope to empower. Again, maraming salamat po. Mabuhay and aloha. Hey, aloha, and welcome back to this episode of Security Matters Hawaii. We're in the Think Tech Hawaii studio, and we've got Mel Fathobab with us. He's remote today, and we are talking about the friendship advantage. Mel, we're going to get into this book a little bit now. We've done the background, I think, for everybody. Um, we talked a little bit about Carl's story, uh, but I want to get into these seven keys. You know, there's a, a this starts this first chapter really rolls into some of the research that you did. Um, I think to support that that meaningful workplace relationships really can create a better business. Yes. So the keys. Um, you want me to get going in there, or do you want to prompt uh, sure. me? What's your sense? Well, I was just yeah. um, so this research was um, I, I you know I, I read through it. I didn't I didn't notice if it was um, was it twenty years old, was it ten years old, was it was it modern? Is it ongoing work that you continue to keep track of to just to help sort of bolster for maybe some people who are more metric driven. You know, ooh, what's this really going to get me? You know, if I do this investment in my people. Yeah, yeah. So the work that is the the, the majority of the book is is purely based on my own observations okay. of working with over 20,000 CEOs and 2,000 groups since 1991. And that is absolutely purely my observation in working with these groups. Okay. However, however, there is some research uh, in the book which cites how much more productive people are, how much happier they are, how much nicer they are to the customers, how much healthier they are if they have a best friend at work, if they have somebody they could trust and talk to at work. So that research has been done and it is out there and uh, you'll see it referenced in the book. But they, they're, clearly there's lots of research that shows that having a friend at work is absolutely, has a big impact on yeah. all sorts of areas. And I think it's a great way to start the book as well because it, if you're reading it for a business purpose, like from a, a business owner and you're trying to understand maybe some of the things you are or aren't doing with your organization, that should give you enough impetus to, to turn the page to, to chapter two, which gets us into that, that one of that first tough things, which is judgment. Um, you know, it, it can be one of the really biggest traps. You know, when we, we think we're encouraging someone or we're saying something to someone and maybe we're trying to help them, but we're really coming off as very judgmental or they're just perceiving what we're saying is judgmental when we didn't intend it that way. Um, how do we avoid um, that, 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 uh, that trap of, of getting into that judgment mentality? Yeah, so I think the most common way that people get trapped in that is when somebody is needing help, they often say, I want your advice. And you can interpret it that different ways. If I say, I want your advice, you could say, oh, he wants me to tell him what to do. Okay. Or you could say, uh, he wants me to listen and to understand what's going on. Or you could say, he'd like my experience. What have I been through that might be similar, that might be helpful? And the path you choose can have different implications. So, you know, if you have children, I know you do, but for those people that do out there, you know pretty early on the moment that they start to tell you, I'm not doing this because you told me to do it. <laughs> right? Yeah. And yeah. you know, you're in Harnish, I believe, uh, from Gazelles and Scaling Up. And one of the things he always says, I think tongue in cheek to the CEOs that he works with is, you guys are not really in business to do whatever you think your business does. You're running adult daycare center. Uh. And so... <laughs> And so in that, in that paradigm, 
uh, you know, you could say whether it's your employees or whether it's your children or whether it's your friends, just giving advice uh, obliviously is a big trap for somebody mm. feeling judged. Mm. And so when somebody says to me, I want your advice, you know, the first thing I say was, is tell me what's going on. And then when they tell me what's going on and I understand it, you know, I make sure I understand it. And then I want to find out what, what they feel about that. So mm. often you get a lot of facts, but is it something frustrating? Is it angry, angering you? Is it making you sad? What, what are your emotions? So I could fully understand how it's impacting you. Oh, it's and then I might say, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, I was going to say the giving of advice starts with more questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> to understand. Absolutely. Awesome. And then I might say, hey, so how can I help? Right? And often my friends might say, well, that was helpful already. You're such a great listener. Thank you. I feel heard. I feel understood. Sometimes awesome. that's all you have to do. Okay. Uh, but sometimes it takes a little more. And I say, well, would you like some experience? I have a similar thing that happened to me. Yeah, that kind of sharing is is awesome and it's I, I do think people have to train themselves to do that right it just takes practice um one yeah, of the next I think that, sure yeah. well, one of the next keys that um i was wondering uh mischief is fun can that go too far <laughs> it can go too far you gotta be careful right? Listen, I, when i thought of this uh as one of the chapters i definitely had mixed feelings on the one hand i chuckled i was excited I knew it's real. I know it's real, right? Because you know your closest friends are people with whom you do something where you are a little more comfortable that you wouldn't do with people that are not your closest friend. Yes, And Agreed. by having that differentiator, the very people with whom you don't do that, already you have a barrier with because mm -hmm. you're not being yourself. Mm -hmm. Very good. So I don't care if throwing snowballs at cars when you're a kid <laughs> or throwing firecrackers in a trash can and watching the lid blow off. <laughs> but yeah. what is it? What is it that connects you in a mischievous way? Huh. Yeah, trust, maybe, yeah? Yeah. It okay. shows I trust you. Yeah. And then, um, so our next key is uh, this, the vulnerability. And we've, uh, we've been doing some Brene Brown work at our place with shame and vulnerability. Um, really tough really tough one for a lot of people to practice and to, to get into a, a vulnerable state or recognizing when their courage takes is vulnerable as well um what kind of advice do you have for people to practice being vulnerable yeah so the first thing i just want to quote because i think it's brilliant when i heard it david bradford who is a professor at the stanford graduate school of business says vulnerability is the currency of relationships and without relationships, vulnerability, without vulnerability, relationships remain surface. Yeah. Uh, so when I first heard that, it just hit me between the eyes as the most succinct way to explain the value. So you have to take a risk. I got that. And you have to decide with whom you're willing to take that risk. And that takes a leap of faith. But the thing to remember is there's a chicken and egg of who goes first. Will you go first? Will I go first? Mm. And at some point, at some point, somebody has to say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take this risk. And when that happens, I'm watching very carefully to see, does the other person reciprocate? Or do they roll their eyes and come across as judgmental? Mm. Or do they just give me advice? Or do they tell me, oh, your issue is no big deal? And just kind of... <laughs> Terrible. Yeah. And if those things happen, what do you think I do next time? I'm with that person. No, you don't talk. <laughs> no more sharing. No, I say, no, fine. Life couldn't be better. <laughs> awesome. So we have um, so back to, yeah. we're back to kind truths. So kind truth. Yeah, uh, yeah we're, we're, we've been saying clear, clear is kind in our office. You know, that's, um, that's another one that people don't always receive well. Um, and I think the book does a great job of talking about sender receiver and and understanding mess messaging and you know how how things can be miscommunicated and how to work through that. Um, so kind truths uh, is that a uh, 
something you have to practice in the groups that you facilitate? Because um, I think it would take a bit of learning for a lot of folks. Yeah, so every meeting, we start with something we call clearing the air. We go around the, the room and each person looks at each other person and says, I'm clean with you, or briefly says, here's why I'm not clean with you. It hurt my feelings that you didn't respond to 10 emails of mine. Um, or you're late and we waited for you and uh, that bothered me, right? And so it's little things, but if I don't say them to you, mm -hmm. either I'm just bursting inside, carrying it with me, continuing to make up stories about you, which are judgments yes. and probably not true, uh, or I'm doing what's even worse and poisoning other people, right? I complain to other people about you. Mm. And now I'm unfairly poisoning them without giving you an opportunity to ever be aware mm. of how I feel mm. and how I was impacted by what you did. Wow. Um, we've only got a minute or so left, but... Um... One thing about that, one of the last points, uh, not, not one of the last ones, but one of the next chapters is about sharing and generosity. And you're being very generous with your, your information here today. And I want to thank you for that. Um, I want to let everyone know this is a great quick read with great tools that you can deploy very rapidly. You can read this before you even go to a meeting. You can read a chapter and bring some more skills when you walk in the door for that meeting. Uh, Mo, some thank you for take your a, generosity. Yeah, I know. Thank you. But take a final minute. What's your, your one, number one tagline you want to share with our, with our audience today? <laughs> well, as it relates to generosity, I'm going to quote my friend Maria Sipka from Sydney, Australia, who says, people either come from Givington or taking. And so I think I come from Givington. And as such, I choose to surround myself that also come from Givington. Because if you don't, then somebody's going to struggle in that puzzle. Awesome. Thank you so much. Be from Givington, people, not from Takington. Thanks, Mo. We'll talk again soon. And thank, thanks to our audience out there you. for joining us today. Aloha, everyone. My pleasure. Bye-bye.